a lot about land management. So I just like to start by giving um, quick acknowledgement to the ancestral unceded territory of the Abenaki people that we're learning on and organizing on today. Um, I think it's really important that we recognize that and remember that land management goes back really far on the landscape. And that's what I'm really excited to talk about. A lot of our um, thought processes for ecology, because we're humans, go on a human time scale. So on the decade level, maybe to the couple of century level, but I'm gonna go a little bit further back and kind of form a more of a foundation for why grassland birds are in the situation they're in today. In case you're not familiar with VCE, uh, we're a, a research nonprofit headquartered in Norwich. Uh, some of the projects you might be familiar with are common loon conservation, uh, maybe Vermont eBird, or um, iNaturalist. And then we also just started up the uh, Vermont Butterfly Atlas this year. So if you have butterflies on your property, we'd love to get some reports from them. And uh, we have some, uh, we have another person on staff who, who can help you with that. Vermont's hay fields and grasslands are pretty, they're, ne they're nestled between mountains and Lake Champlain. And even Lake Champlain, they're nestled around mountains um, on the other side, right? And that's kind of been the way it's been for the past couple centuries. Uh, 500-ish years ago, there really weren't a whole ton of grasslands in Vermont. Um, the bobolink and meadowlark populations were much lower a couple hundred years ago until uh, deforestation in the past 200 years. And things have kind of started to revert back to more of a reforested landscape with things like the beaver being reestablished deer making a big recovery. Uh, and although we've lost wolves, we do have coyotes that have kind of moved in to replace that niche a little bit. And this is a classic case of reforestation. This is the same mountainside in Vermont. It went from extremely deforested, almost entirely uh, sheep uh, and then dairy cattle. Um, and now it's been reforested a lot. There's been a lot of uh, a lot of pressure for re reforestation for good reason in Vermont. Um, and this is not going to be, you know, me trashing any of that reforestation or anything like that, because that has been a really good thing to see and really restorative for some of our landscape uh, and ecology and just, you know, uh, ecological functions. But I'm going to start a little bit even further back than that um, in the Pleistocene epoch. So this is the last ice age. Um, around 14,000 years ago, the ice sheet began to recede. And when the ice sheets recede, we undergo something called secession. In this case, primary secession, because underneath these big ice sheets, there was nothing but rock and soils had to be made. So you had things like lichens come in and then maybe some insects and fungi come in. And then eventually grasses and perennials can come in once there's a little bit more soil built up. So this Glacial erratic here um, is up in the Alaskan range, and it's a little bit of a snapshot after a glacier has receded um, because it's you no know, much more recent glaciation event up there. So this is kind of a, a idea of what primary secession looks like when it's in that grass and perennial stage. And that's kind of what happened up in the New England landscape. You had glaciers recede, and then this is a pollen record. And you would have some pollen from prairie uh, flowers, basically, out in the, the east here. And that extends from this prairie peninsula, which is a little bit below where the prairie uh, begins uh, today. And that extended all the way to the eastern seaboard up through southern New England, a little bit into Vermont, but not a whole ton, not nearly as much as down some of the sandier regions along the coast. But what did happen to Vermont is we had some really big glacial lakes form. Uh, this is uh, basically where Stowe and Waterbury are today and um, down to Montpelier. And to the east, or rather to the west, where Lake Champlain would be, there was still a big ice sheet. So that was damming up the water from, from flowing out. What eventually happened is out of this 
southern gulf here, the Williamstown Gulf, the lake eventually um, dried out and it, uh, it eroded through and uh, drained through the Connecticut River, uh, which at the time was also a glacial lake called the, the Glacial Lake Hitchcock. And you can see there are a bunch of other glacial lakes that we had across the state, not all occurring at the same exact time, but we had a good amount. And so when you have these large glacial areas that become a big lake and then drain out, you're still gonna have to undergo early secession. And there's been evidence for this looking at some of the insects we have, both on the Midwestern prairies, uh, well, in this case, Michigan, and along the coast um, and some of our like heaths uh, and, and barrens, there's a, a proposed mechanism of dispersal when these uh, glacial lakes drained and they left big empty valleys where the ice had been, that these little spittle bugs made their way southeast across the state. And then eventually a lot of this got reforested, but along the coast, there remained some of these patches that could host these species. So this has been one of the stronger indicators of uh, a native Atlantic prairie that a lot of the evidence has kind of gone away and you don't see it in the landscape nearly as much. And this is uh, just a comparison of that proposed uh, the proposed route um, of dispersal and some of the glacial lakes. So you can see the glacial lake Winooski feeds right down through the I-89 corridor. Um, and then down to the Connecticut River Basin, and then over here as well, down to the Taconics, uh, a couple other little ice sheets here, um, and then drained out through the south. So why don't we still have these landscapes that might sustain like those uh, grassland spittle bugs that I had just shown? It's because of secondary secession. So after all the plants move back in and soils remade, you might undergo a very big natural disaster, like a severe flood that totally wipes out, uh, wipes out the, the landscape, um, a really big rock slide or mud slide, or kind of most commonly thought of um, fires. So you have a big fire event, all the brush gets burned down, and that some, it has to start somewhere, you know, it has to start with the grasses and perennials as the trees come in, and that only lasts a couple of years. But the soil's already been built, so it's not like you have to undergo that entire, that entire process again. This is an example of a place that you really wouldn't expect seeing a big open prairie like this. This is a natural prairie, photos from around 1911. Um, and it has taken place on Long Island at the Hampstead Plains. Um, at the time of uh, European settlement, this was still a wide open area. Um, in 1911, someone wrote there were birds there that weren't found elsewhere, such as certain sparrows and meadowlarks. That sp those sparrows, you know, might be savannah sparrows, maybe grasshopper sparrows. Um, and it's a kind of a sad story of what happened to this. And it's a, kind of a microcosm of what's happening with grasslands all over the place. Uh, they just disappear and they get built over. In 1850, there was some grazing, um, not a whole, whole ton. The entire parcel basically was sold in 1870-ish, uh, and they developed it into a planned community. And then by the time these photos were taken in 1911, only one fifth of that entire area remained. Um, so now you can see there's three little parcels, the orange parcels, those are really the only uh, good quality habitat left in that area. Um, of course, you can see a big golf course. And in, in theory, there might be some little parcels of, of suitable habitat in there, but not much. And in Northern Long Island, this is basically all just golf courses as well. So this green space is in good quality green space. Uh, there's a lot of causes. Um, for open areas. It's predicted that about 9% of the Northeast was grassland prior to European settlement. Um, indigenous people was a big reason for that or uh, was a reason for that. Depends where you were in the landscape. Um, if you're closer to the coast where some of the populations were higher, there might have been some more fires for uh, clearing underbrush or preparing land for planting 
or just an accidental fire in the dry season. Um, then you also had areas that had beavers, so massive beaver plains that existed prior to, to beavers being wiped out, um, large floodplains on some of the bigger rivers, a couple other ways that this all, oops, sorry, just looking to chat, um, that there were still openings on the landscape. And today, some of these landscape openings are still managed in a similar method using fire. This is Kennebunk Plains in Maine. It's a TNC property. And every couple of years, they go through and do a controlled burn. And then give them another year, some time to recover. A lot of these trees are fire adapted. So they are able to survive once they get to be a certain height. And they might even have cones that only release by fire. It's called a serotonous cone. Um, and then you give it a couple of years, and then you have the metal arcs and upland sandpipers and some other really, really cool, rare declining species that will move in. Um, because people historically have not uh, appreciated the need for natural fires on the landscape and have been suppressing them for a while, these openings have kind of declined, and a lot of them that do exist, such as the uh, the Hampstead Prairie, uh, or the Hampstead Plains, rather, uh, were just totally built over. And we see this in two, two species that I want to kind of touch on that aren't exactly grassland birds we deal with now, um, but this one, Heath Hen, was a subspecies of another, um, of the greater prairie chicken, uh, you see the darker blue areas out in the Midwest, it still has some, some footholds. But throughout all of this range, which I'll show you a map of in a second, is the long grass prairie. And through here, where we had a subspecies called the heath hen, the heath hen is now extinct and it's been lost throughout much of its, much of its historic range. And then another species that people might not know about is the New England cottontail. And this is different than the bunnies you see hopping around that are, um, that are uh, Eastern cottontail or snowshoe hare. These are endemic to New England and that Long Island area. They require interlocking tree canopies um, that are between five and 15 feet tall. And I think that helps some over winter. And you can see it had a really small range and has been lost through much of it. It's only in around 15% of its former range. And this is because a lot of these uh, uh, disturbance patterns that are needed to create the openings that it requires to survive aren't occurring anymore. So now we get to present day and uh, prairies are almost entirely synonymous with the Midwest in the US, but they're really expansive and they're sustained by natural processes such as fire or other disturbances and water. Water availability is really what drives the habitats in these areas. More water means less fire, means taller grass, or exactly the opposite. Less water might mean more fire, so shorter shrubby grass. And all these species are on a continuum from that, from that short dry to tall wet. Species down in the bottom left are ones you might find in a shrubbier, um, like a subarctic, uh, landscape, while the ones up in the top right, like Sedren, are really well known for needing dense, moist, thick uh, grasses. So the ones that we mostly have in Vermont that we mostly focus on are Eastern Meadowlark, Bobolink, and Savannah Sparrow. And you can see they all kind of fill right in to the same general area in the middle of this graph. Um, so that's why we, we call them mid-grass species. Um, that's the yellow area in this map. You think about it, we're kind of at the same latitude as this area, have a similar rain pattern to them, um, you know, much more similar to here than we would be down to, you know, the basin steppe or some of these other areas that are much drier. And this makes Vermont's hayfield extremely valuable habitat going forward because Almost all of this region has been lost uh, by either development or agriculture or this fragmentation. So those tall grass prairies here, the green, and this is from 2001. So by now there's less than 1% of native tall grass prairies remaining. There's more of the short grass mixed grass prairies 
because those might be a little bit on the drier side. So it's not as um, you know promising for, for massive ag, but that's not entirely true. But because we have a same habitat or very similar habitat to this region that's lost a lot of the habitat, it gives us the opportunity to provide that habitat and try and supplement what has been lost. We have eight species that I kind of commonly think of in Vermont as our grassland species. Uh, Vesper sparrow, not as much. Uh, it's still a grassland species, but it's a little bit more on that drier side, maybe down uh, in some like the sand barrens and you know, coastal Maine maybe. Um, but they are found in Vermont at some of our sandier sites. And if you notice something, five of them are either threatened or endangered. That's like half of Vermont's t and &E list. Uh, bobolinks declining rapidly as well. They are a species of special concern. Um, going forward, they will maybe start getting listed in, I think, Canada, uh, well, some of the neighboring states. Um, going forward, Canada's going to be very good for the bobolinks, and I'll touch on that. Um, but like Eastern Meadowlark is a threatened species in Canada. Um, it's also a threatened species in New Hampshire, and it's now a threatened species in, in Vermont. And it's also declining range wide. So another reason why the habitat we offer here is very important is because it's not like these birds are only declining here, but they're doing really well elsewhere. They're declining everywhere. So when we have them here, we have a great opportunity to try and help them. And if you look at the, the graph on the right, grasslands are the, the furthest, the, the quickest declining group um, of any of them, except for Hawaiian endemic birds, but that's a whole nother can of worms. Um, kind of interestingly, if you look at the only groups that are either um, increasing or maybe increasing, wetlands and coasts, that's a lot of stuff that you see from, you know, wetland restoration, um, Ducks Unlimited, and some like, the, you know, Duck Stamp, and some of that stuff has done a lot of really good work with restoring habitat for, for waterfowl. Um, so it, there are some, some success stories shown in this, but grassland habitat is by far declining more quickly than a lot of these other places. Here's two examples of that in Vermont. These are from the uh, USGS breeding bird survey. And they are uh, upland sandpiper on the left and eastern meadowlark on the right. Upland sandpiper has all but disappeared from Vermont. Um, there's like four individuals left in the state, uh, but it has been declining. Eastern meadowlarks used to be considered pretty common um, to the point where back when people would do upland sandpiper surveys, they just wouldn't even bother noting if they had a met or yeah, had a metal lark there because the metal larks were common enough that it's just like oh like why bother noting it right and that's not the case anymore um, and I think these graphs are very interesting because they they really do tell a story both of these species had a little bit of a population spike here during the eighties um, and some people may be familiar with what happened then but that was the nineteen eighties farm crisis um, so there's a lot more farms there's a lot more habitat. The uh, interest rates were really high and the land value drop. And so suddenly you had a ton of open habitat that just wasn't being um, actively managed. And so there was nothing destroying nests, which gave these, uh, these species a chance to propagate. Um, shortly after that, you know, several years, that habitat, if it wasn't managed, probably would have grown up into shrubs and then would have no longer been, been useful by either of these species. But it kind of shows the importance and the impact that legislation can have on uh, the recovery and just long-term and short-term um, declines and, and increases in some of these populations. The bobolink is probably the most common grassland species that people talk about. It's the poster child for a lot of grassland conservation because they're very charismatic, they're very easy to see and hear. Um, they have an incredible life history. They migrate like 6,000, 7,000 miles one way each year, um, or each six months, I guess, because they have to do it twice a year. Um, and they're also the only known land bird that migrates annually through the Galapagos Islands. Not all of them, it's like a couple dozen, or you know, 
that's our estimate. And that's what's been found in the past. There's probably more that are isolated that we can't get to, but it's a very small number relative to the entire population. Um, we're not entirely sure the reasoning for that. And there's ongoing research into that. Uh, but it's just a really interesting thing that these birds are making an extra couple thousand mile detour out to the middle of the ocean uh, for what appears to us at least no reason. Um, they are also a vector, a vector for avian malaria to the Galapagos, uh, which going forward as the climate changes is going to be more and more of an issue for a lot of species of bird. So that's just another future uh, avenue for, for research that's kind of currently being investigated. They're very cool in that they use uh, the stars to help navigate for this really, really long distance migration. So they use like the stars and then they also use um, an iron oxide. So basically like a magnet that's kind of like in their, in their beak. And that um, it's thought to act as like an inclin like the the inclination because as you as you approach true north uh, magnetic north uh, misaligned, so they have to compensate for that. So very complex navigation system, which obviously is needed if you're trying to make a seven thousand one way trip, uh, you know, with no GPS unit. <laughs> Savannah sparrows are a species you often see with bobolinks. In general, if you have bobolinks, you also will have savannah sparrows and vice versa. These are not nearly as long distance of migrants. In, case, uh, in some places, they are actually resident, um, but they do flood through during migration in pretty heavy numbers. You also will see them in places that are a little bit shorter of grasses than bobolinks. They re-nest um, more readily. And so if you have one individual that has its uh, nest destroyed by haying, it might try to nest again very soon after that in shorter grass. Um, I think one individual was recorded uh, attempting to re-nest like five times in one season, which is a little, a little sad, but uh, it, it kind of shows their resilience to habitat destruction compared to bobolinks where they might try to get a second clutch off if their nest is destroyed early enough. But because they have such a long migration that they need to prepare for, they they have to at some point kind of be like, I, I, I'm not going to be able to breed this year. I have to start stocking up on calories for my upcoming massive trip. The metal lurks have been a species of great interest in Vermont these past couple of years because they are the newest addition to the threatened endangered species bird list. Uh, grassland bird, like five or four of the other species on the list. And we're kind of at the North uh, Eastern range. Uh, there are some other populations a little bit further North and obviously up in Canada. And they used to be a lot more widespread in Vermont. It used to be pretty common statewide-ish, at least in the Connecticut River Valley um, and up near like Orleans County and then definitely in Lake Champlain. But now it's pretty much only relegated to Lake Champlain, a couple isolated spots elsewhere. Uh, this is a map from this most recent season of Metalark monitoring. On the left, it's just the number, all the observations that were submitted to me. You can see it's almost all in the Champlain Valley with a couple isolated sites that we found uh, by doing like specialized like site specific surveys. Uh, and then on the right, it's all the occupied sites. And it's only three sites that I know of off the top of my head um, that have confirmed metal arc breeding at them. I think that there is at least another two that I want to look at this year that I think also have nesting, but we it just we just haven't been able to confirm it yet. Um, and I will also note that about between a quarter and a third of the entire state population is on VLT associated lands. Um, which is you know, a massive percentage of any group of species, especially for an endangered species where that could be between you know, 25 and 33 birds-ish uh, is all on VLT land, and that's a significant portion of the population. This shows the, the importance of um, you know, important and uh, land management and land conservation for these species that are very land deprived. What's the acronym for? 
Uh, I'm not sure acronym. Oh, VLT, yes, Vermont Land Trust. Yes, yes. And we have been in, involved in a really cool project um, in association with the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center. They have a project called the Migratory Connectivity Project, which is putting little GPS trackers across different species, um, across their entire range to see how the migratory connectivity is, our species mostly overwintering in one spot and then return to the same spot. Um, and they're doing this for uh, like 20 sites, uh, both for Eastern Meadowlark and their sister species, the Western Meadowlark. So we tag five birds here uh, in last May and June. They shipped us the tags. And at one site in, uh, in Swan at Mrs. Coy National Wildlife Refuge, at two sites, actually three sites in Charlotte and one site in Bennington. Unfortunately, two of those tags haven't broadcast back yet. These actually like broadcast once every month back to a satellite to give us a live feed of where these birds are. And two of them haven't broadcast back. So we have to go and recapture them and hope that the data is still on the unit, just hadn't been sent back to the satellite. Um, and one of these birds is on its way back. I think the pink bird that overwintered in Northern Virginia uh, as of March 10th, I think it was the last time I got an update on it that it had started to move. Um, and we are planning on putting out five more tags this year, which I'm really excited about. This has been a really, really fun project to be involved with. And probably the paper will be coming out in you know, the next two years maybe i'm not 100 percent sure now with this added season of tagging but it's really cool looking at the comparison between the eastern and western metal arc because the western metal arcs do appear to be uh more migratory than these which obviously stayed along the eastern seaboard and one final species i want to touch on is the upland sandpiper i have mentioned it a couple times uh, this is another long distance migrant, although the map doesn't entirely reflect, reflect correctly because one of my coworkers, Jason, put a GPS tracker out on an upland sandpiper in, I think, Massachusetts. And it actually overwintered in the Amazon, like a, basically like along the Amazon River, like very, very close to the Amazon River, um, which had never been documented before. And I don't think has been documented since. Of course, there aren't many people that are birding in some of these uh, really, really isolated places. But it just shows how much we don't know about birds because statistically, the one bird that they tagged was not the only bird to overwinter down that area. And I kind of think of upland sandpipers as about 25 years ahead of meadowlarks in terms of their population decline. Here, there were uh, 126 birds-ish in 1991. Um, and by 1998, there, there was only like a third that many, or maybe about half that many. Uh, that's kind of what we're seeing with Eastern meadowlark now. They're declining almost 9% a year. So this is a rough estimate of like our timeline. We're kind of right after... 1991, we're maybe at like 1995, maybe 1994 right now in terms of like the Eastern Meadowlark population, you kind of can extrapolate out and be like, oh, wow, we really got to get going and conserving these birds before they are lost, like Upland Sandpiper has been effectively lost from the state. There's only one remaining site that has the two birds or the two pairs at it. It used to be found in... Montpelier at the airport hasn't been there in you know, probably 10, 20 years. Uh, used to be really common in Cornwall and some of the other areas in the Champlain Valley. Uh, and they just very seldom seen during migration, if ever. I want to know going to be a little bit doom and gloom for a second. And I also want to try and give some solutions and some hope that, you know, here in Vermont, we do have a lot that we can do to try and keep these species both in Vermont and on just the U.S. landscape as a whole. The most important thing that drives the 
habitat um, choice for the species appears to be the field size and the field shape. So they like having a really big interior area. So even a field that's smaller, such as this 20 acre instead of the 25 acre, the actual interior area of the 20 acre field is much higher because it's of like a more round shape. Funky shaped fields, just by basic geometry, are not going to have the same interior area, which is what these species really like. And different species appear to have different size requirements. Um, in general, for bobolinks and savanna sparrows, uh, we say 10 acres is like a minimum field size. If it's a really nice and round field, maybe you get away with seven, maybe even a little bit less. And if you're neighboring a field and it's basically just one giant field, it doesn't matter nearly as much how big your actual individual parcel is. And this also kind of shows why certain species have declined quicker than others. If you're a upland sandpiper and you need these massive unopened blocks of grassland, as soon as they start getting fragmented up with, uh, oh, cool, a, a flashy new I-89 going in past the historic spot and some new housing developments and some row crops coming in, that's going to really eat up your habitat and fragment it a lot more than if you're a little bobolink that only needs a 10-acre unbroken area. Um, I'd say that this eastern meadowlark, they could probably go a little bit smaller than 60 acres, uh, at least based on my experience in Vermont. It seems like some individuals are using smaller sized fields, and then it's also really impacted by the openness of the area. So this is Costingham Farms in Norwich, and when I say openness, this is kind of what I'm referring to. You have a really nice open line of view to the horizon. You're up, you have a good view out, potentially if there's any predators or anything like that. Um, and this also seems really, really important for basically all grassland birds. So here's a satellite view of the farm. This black camera is basically where I was sitting. And if you look down here, there's a tree. You can just barely see the crest of it. And you can also see that tree showing up on this 3D representation. This is the 3D image, or the 2D image of the 3D um, landscape. Um, and then you can use software to basically estimate how open the landscape is. And so you see right around this tree, it's going to kind of impact the openness because you're going to be just staring at a tree. But as soon as you get further enough away and it's uphill a little bit, you're still just going to be seeing open landscape. And so these birds really like being in the interior, away from the edges where it's nice and open to the landscape. So if you have a, uh, you know, maybe like a slight gentle hill on your property, the top of the hill might be the quote unquote best quality habitat. Of course, there's a lot of nuance to that, but you can just kind of think of the more open, the better. Kind of like with humans, we like having a nice view to the horizon. You know, that's always a nice thing to get a picture of. Kind of the same thing. And the classic management for these species is to just hold off on mowing until August 1st or you know, at least July 15th, depending where you are in the state and you know, obviously in the country. Um, that's not possible for a lot of people, especially if you're a dairy farmer. The big change from um, sheep, a sheep-based agricultural economy to dairy also did not do the birds well because dairy cows require very protein and nutrient rich feed, um, which the sheep really didn't nearly as much. And so if, if you have a cow that you know needs high quality uh, nutrient rich grass, you have to cut it like three times a season because over time, eventually the grass loses its nutrients. So if you aren't gonna hay at all the entire season, this last cut here, is not going to be great quality. You know, maybe use it for some scarecrows, but if you're trying to make like silage or anything, that's un it's unusable. Um, as a way to kind of improve that second cut, in theory, you could also cut before June 1st um, and then hold off until, we say 65 days, that basically puts you into early August. This can work in areas of the Champlain Valley, other areas of the state, 
that might not be enough time because the grass has to grow enough for um the grass to grow enough for the birds to actually re-nest. Um, and also some places that just doesn't seem to work that they won't re-nest. Like it was, this was tried in Ontario and it just didn't work. Uh, but in the in Charlotte, it does, or it appears to at least. Second cut, yeah. So this way you get one first cut here, and then at least the second cut will be slightly more nutrient rich. Still not nearly as much if you had done five cuts during the season, but it's a little bit better than, than the alternative. A big issue we're seeing now, though, is that invasive plants can really move in when you're doing this delay cutting. Um, if you're only cutting in late August or in mid-August, that gives species like uh, you know, Queen Anne's lace or wild carrot or some of these other species plenty of time to seed and just continue to invade the field and create these really, really dense stands that block out all the sunlight for grasses and anything else to grow. And because these birds need grasses, they can't nest in a really, really dense patch of um, you know, poison parsnip or anything like that. So you can try and avoid this by cutting around the edge because that's in theory where these uh, invasives tend to show up first. So because bobolinks and other grassland birds nest in the interior fields, can use that to your advantage and just mow maybe the edge X meters, you know, X amount of yards um, as, as far as you need to as the, the, uh, inv the invasion is extending into the field. And you can try and take care of that to prevent it from getting well established. Because once it's well established, you're basically going to have to cut your field three times a season just to prevent these from seeding. And then you have to do that for several years after until the seeds um, in like the seed bank in the soil are no longer viable. Uh, also, if you have one piece of equipment that's being shared between multiple properties and you know one property does have an invasive present, it would pay to try and clean machinery as best as possible to try and prevent seeds from spreading. Um, like yellow rattle, for instance, the seeds aren't going to spread by the wind really much, but they might spread if they get stuck on the equipment. Uh, obviously much easier said than done. It's really hard to clean a tractor off when you're in the field. You know, your hose isn't going to get anywhere, but just it's something to be mindful of. It's something to do, you know, regular monitoring of your fields for it, just doing a quick walk around, seeing if you see any new plants that are coming in and rapidly expanding. The quicker you can get on that and maybe even hand cut it, the better it's going to be for the birds and for you in the long run. Habitat conversion, uh, as I mentioned, that's really where these birds are suffering the most. This is beautiful, easy development area um, in Lake Champlain. It's going to be the most agriculturally, uh, you know, beneficial and, and profitable region for some of these products out in the Midwest, where it's the breadbasket. Uh, you know, you're you're just going to take out some of these and do a big monoculture of whatever grain might net you the most money. Um, you know, solar power is becoming more and more of an issue. I am very pro solar, but I think that instead of, you know, beautiful swaths of grassland bird habitat, we got so many roofs that don't have solar panels on them. So I, I'm, I'm very, I'm a proponent of responsible solar. I don't think we should be destroying habitat to try and save other habitat elsewhere by not burning stuff. But that's a discussion for a whole nother, whole nother day. Um, something that we've been seeing in Vermont, especially, has been um, the decline in some of our agricultural industries, especially dairy. And um, you know, these this graph ends in 2019. I'm sure in 2020 things were also exacerbated. Um, so just this is also causing big declines because if you had two small farms and they both go under, maybe someone might you know maybe someone doesn't want to uh, take on the farm. So they sell it off to a giant conglomerate, and now they're trying to milk every cent of silage they can. They're not going to be, you know, maybe not be as willing to, to do anything for the birds on their property. And also, people might want to do stuff for birds on their property, but they just can't because there's financial constraints or there are other issues at, at play. Um, so this is kind of a 
an issue that I think everyone's dealing with in many different facets, whether it be Vermont um, Ag or you know VLT and NOFA. Um, but this is is this a trend that we have been seeing in Vermont that has kind of also uh, increased some of these issues? So that was you know a little bit of doom and gloom, um, and we're not entirely done. But the good news is in Vermont we are expected to have a pretty high um, capacity for future conservation for these birds. This is a map um, from the Bob Link uh, Full Life Cycle Conservation Plan. It's an entire booklet basically detailing every single aspect of the Bob Link's full life, whether it be in Bolivia or up here, and every single threat they, they posed and, and all the conservation. So it's, a, it's a fascinating read. It only came out a couple of years ago. It was co-authored by someone at VCE, Roz, who now works at Vermont Fish and Wildlife. Um, and the blue just means that there's more opportunities for conservation. Uh, that's stuff like climate resilience, um, current bobolink abundance, uh, the area of grass relative to other counties in the state, to other counties in the region, and to other counties in the breeding range, um, soil productivity, so like the chance that things might get transitioned to a, a commodity crop. And you see that the we are we're right up there. New England, uh, New York, um, uh, the Lake Superior region. Um, and a lot of this is climate resilience. Bobolinks are not supposed to fare too well here with climate change. These are two maps comparing two different situations. The one on the left is kind of the what's expected to happen. All the red is habitat and range being lost, and the blue is what's being gained. So a massive northward shift. Um, and a lot of this is going to be due to droughts, and uh, keeping these long grass prairies active and um, healthy. It's gonna be stuff like um, droughts, increasing stresses on food production. So um, if there's a, a piece of land conserved under the farm bill, it might be released to agriculture during drought conditions. And then on the right, which is kind of like the worst case, um, which is by 2080, there's a, a three degree increase, uh, almost all their U.S. range is going to be lost, right, including most of Vermont. Um, though this is, like I said, worst case scenario, and there are still little pockets of Vermont that are modeled to have this uh, bobbling habitat. So you know, that's kind of a good sign, right? This worst case scenario, Vermont still has a little bit of breeding habitat, and that's, you know, there's four states, five states that are kind of like that in that worst case scenario. Um, so no, that's that's a good sign, right? And it gives us hope that we're in a good place going forward. Um, one issue we might be experiencing are the types of grasses that people plant. Um, the kind of question just came up. Um, I have some more information on specific varieties, but you can break grasses into two different um, groups the warm season and the cool season. Warm season grasses are ones made from like the, like, you know, south of, you know, more Southern areas of the country. Cool season grasses are the ones you see up in like those native mid grass prairies. Um, the cool grasses are uh, the most common in Vermont and they are what we would classify as our native grasses. And they require a lot of input and a lot of effort. And they give you two distinctive growing seasons, one here uh, between April and May and one toward the end of the year as well. So the, the theory is that if you're trying to do two cuts in a year and you're trying to not cut during the breeding season, cool grass is, would give you a higher chance of being able to do an early cut and a late cut and kind of maximize that conservation value while also maximizing the output. However, it's not as drought, drought tolerant as these warm season grasses, um, which also require much less input and have a higher output. So we might be seeing a shift um, in some areas of the historically cool grass range where warm season grasses are being more and more planted because they are drought tolerant and easier to grow with less, less you know, input and nutrients and, uh, you know, uh, buffering and stuff like that. Um, so that's just kind of something to keep an eye out for. I don't know 
in Vermont in the immediate future how much of an issue this is because I think pool season grasses still are pretty dominant. But it's just kind of an interesting thing going forward to see how this might kind of impact things in other parts of the country as well. Uh, there are some uh, funding opportunities to DeLamo. Obviously, for anything that's uh, living in an agricultural setting, there's going to be an added difficulty of the economic aspect of things. Um, it's not like a forest where uh, you can basically just let it go by itself for 30 years and just don't touch it. And you know, maybe you need to do some, main, some minor removals to release some shelter woods or whatever. Um, but like you can just basically let the woods go. With grasslands, you can't. And same with shrub shrublands, because you have to mow them at least once every two or three years, or else the habitat's going to grow up and be shrubby. So there, and and if you are a um, farmer that requires, or you know, even just someone that that depends on their their hay field for you know some type of income, um, you know, it is kind of a bank account for some people. It's going to be a costly investment um, to delay hay your field. So there's two programs from NRCS. Um, there's Equip and CSP. They both basically have a minimum of 20 acres, and there are some area requirements. Um, like if you're out in um, Danby or like Jamaica, yeah. If you're in Jamaica, you're gonna be much less qualified, much less likely to qualify for one of these funding programs than if you're in Orwell. Um, I describe Equip as uh, it's like the funding to get your property in kind of good shape, and that's how it's been described as me. So uh, it's like do your first couple of years of of uh, uh, you know, maybe invasive removal or your delay haying, and then CSP um, can be used to kind of keep it in that good shape. The Bobbling Project is a private um, group. Uh, it's, I think it's managed by Massachusetts Audubon, but like any money donated in Vermont stays in Vermont. Um, Audubon Vermont is involved with that. That's really nice because it's not federal government, so it's you know might be a, there might be a little bit less red tape but it also only offers like a third the amount. So that is an option, uh, you know, might make sense to start with this until you have a sense of the EQIP paperwork or whatever, or you can just reach out to the Bobbling Project or one of the regional EQIP offices or uh, one of the regional NRCS offices and they have um, people that can help talk you through the process. Um, I'm getting a little bit out of time here. So to say, I'm happy to come out to meet with people at their, at their properties. Um, you know, even if you aren't delay hang, I'd still be happy to get out there just to talk about the birds with you. And, you know, maybe I could kind of learn a little bit about what management is being actively practiced in hay fields. You know, I'm always eager to learn more about that aspect. Um, maybe you have 30 acres and you can only delay hay five of those. I could come and point like, oh, th this is the five best acres of habitat. If you're going to delay hay, delay this section. Or maybe you have yellow rattle sneaking into your property and you don't know about it. I can get out and be like, oh, like, you know, this is something you might want to take a look at. Um, so I'll, I'll give you my contact info in a second. eBird, I'm always soliciting observations on eBird. Um, if you know what this is, it's an app. If you see a bird, you can basically open up um, an app and submit the sighting to a central database that has over a billion observations in it. Vermont is by far... Um, the most active eBird community of any state, except maybe Alaska, but that's a population thing. It also is kind of Vermont. But we're, Vermont is the highest eBird usage per capita. And because we're the highest in the US, that just kind of means we're the highest in the world because this is a Cornell project. So tons of people in Vermont are on it. I highly suggest you can put your observations and, and contribute to really meaningful scientists uh, science. I'm always looking for Eastern meadowlarks. I coordinate state surveys for these. If you see a meadowlark or maybe even have a meadowlark on your property, I'd love if you could reach out to me. Here's my contact info, um, grasslands at vtecostudies.org. I have some cool resources like a bobbling nesting calendar that we get remade each year. I have a stack, I, mean, I have a whole box full of these really nice little pamphlets that go over conservation. If you are, you know, a conservation commission or a library, I'd be happy to mail some to you. Um, here's our social media stuff. If you ever just want to follow us on social media, 
And then I was also asked to announce some upcoming uh, upcoming VLT stuff. And I think I I got I got um I got dragged into doing the one on the 13th. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know how, but they they talked me into it. So I'll be doing this one on the 13th. And I'm really excited for it. And um, you know, they have a couple others going on. It's vernal pool season. I love vernal pools, so it's an exciting time of year with the birds arriving and the amphibians on the move. Um so thank you so much for for listening to me, Jabber. I probably a little bit more content tried to sandwich in there than I should have, but I hope that you know this is at least a little bit different than other grassland bird talks you've heard. I know I've given one to VLT before. I've probably given several for VLT before and other groups around the state. And I, I want to just do a little a little bit different of an angle. And I hope that you kind of you know enjoyed hearing a little bit more about the geology about of Vermont because I think that one of my biggest regrets is not learning more about that when I was in school still um so yeah I just I hope you enjoyed it and don't continue supporting VLT and other conservation groups that's all I can really ask awesome thank you so much Kevin and we'll get to a few questions before but um yeah we have a, a request in the chat to go back to the slide where you shared your contact information. So there we are. Um, it looks like there are a few requests in the chat of folks that want you to come visit. So their properties. So you can grasslands at vtecostudies.org is how you can contact Kevin. Um, and we'll send out a follow-up email as well with a recording to this presentation. And we'll include that email there as well. So don't feel like you need to write it down right now, but um, that's how you can get in touch with Kevin. Um, and we'll take, we'll get a to a few questions here. Um, here's a person asking for a fact sheet um, about Eastern Meadowlarks to give to their neighbors um, to kind of share the information. So it sounds like you might have some resources um, yeah, I can, available. I can, yeah, I can, I'll craft something up. Okay, yeah. And so we can maybe include a link to that in our follow-up email. Um, so I think this person is interested in sharing with their neighbors who um, hay their fields. Great. So we can, we can follow up with more information on that. Um, Another question here from David, he has an open meadow with long views and in a quiet safe area, but the meadow is only three or four acres. Are there any grassland birds he could attract? And if so, is there anything he can do to attract them? It's probably a little bit on that. Where's uh, location? Did he didn't say where it is. That's probably a little bit on the small side for like a grassland bird. Um, but like there are birds that like use grasslands that I didn't really touch on. I mean, stuff like bluebirds, like they require grassland habitats. Um, so I, put, I probably not grassland specific birds, but definitely grassland adjacent birds. So bluebirds, mm -hmm. swallows. Um, if you're in an area that's near Purple Martin House, those are really cool. Um, chipping sparrows and song sparrows and field sparrows maybe. So there's definitely a ton of birds that will use it. Um, and I'll say that no matter what, an open unhayed field is far superior in any ecological value to a hayed lawn or manicured lawn. So even if it's not grassland birds, going to be pollinators or something in there. Great, thank you. Um, a question here from Justin who asks, how common were native WSGs like little blue stem Indian grass and big blue stem during pre-Columbian times? I don't know if I have a quantitative answer for that. Um, a lot of like the evidence of like fire and stuff was based on charcoal records. So not like actual like, you know, people seeing the grasses. So I'm not 100% sure. I could definitely get back to you and look at it. I have like a, a history of grasslands in the north in the northeast like PDF file that will probably speak to something. So um shoot me an email and I I could probably get a good answer for you there. Great, thank you. Um a question from Lisa who asks, um, I think this is referring to the um the slide where you showed the percentages that Easter of the species were down and spoke to that. She asked, over what time period is the meadow lark down 8.2 percent? Oh, annual. Okay. And, and yeah, an annual decline of 8.2%. Um, when I put that breeding bird survey graph. Yeah. So basically an annual decline of, of the point eight. We, I mean, we have like a hundred birds, a hundred of them left in the state now. So yeah, these are the annual. And, and for, I think there's two species like Sedgren. It's, it, it doesn't have one because it's never picked up because it's so rare. They just don't find it on the survey. I mean, Henslow Sparrow hasn't nested in Vermont since the seventies. So like, 
kind of, that's kind of what the, the situation would deal with. Grassland Spar Grasshopper Sparrows is only at two sites, Franklin County Airport and um, Camp Johnson, I think. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty dire. Yeah, um, here's a question from Kate who asks, um, regarding qualities of open areas, do they prefer fewer trees as perches for predator raptors and that hence would rounder areas be preferred? Like, like a rounder field? Yeah, like, the, yeah. I mean, let's say like a round field just by geometry would give you the, the most area in the interior. Um, the tree question is kind of difficult because like conventional wisdom would say, no, no tree. It's going to block the, the, you know, the openings, but it, on, a, on a big scale, if you have a huge field and there's a couple of scattered trees, there's still going to be plenty of areas that are going to be open enough. And they sometimes do like perching up on trees and singing from them. Metal arcs, if you see a metal arc nine times out of 10, it's either going to be on a post on a tree or on a telephone wire. Um, so I think that they're, I think that like, like scattered trees, as long as it's not really obscuring the view too much, would be totally fine. You know, and, and you know, it also kind of depends on the type. You don't want to be choosing, you know, something that's going to be spreading rapidly and come and you know become a giant uh, hedgerow. But if it's just a couple of trees, I think that'd be totally okay. Okay. Um, here's a question from Casey who asks, what is the best way to figure out if we have grassland birds in our local open spaces? Um, if you, if you go out there, you'll hear them. Um, these birds are, you know, except, except for maybe the male bobolink, um, they're all pretty subdued color. Uh, and even the male bobolink, when you see that head blending into a bunch of, uh, a bunch of dandelions, they're invisible. Um, but if you go out there on, uh, like for metal larks, anytime starting probably next week or two when they're most vocal, you'll hear them. They, they, if you're there for like five minutes, there's like a 95% chance that you'll pick up a bird if it is there. Metal larks have a very distinctive, loud call, and they are incessantly singing it. Um, but they are definitely earlier risers. So try and get out there before nine to find them. Bobolinks, so also metal larks, most sites only have one pair, which is another bad thing. You might go to a site and have 15 bobolink pairs, but only one metal lark pair. But once bobolinks arrive in mid-May, they have a really, really distinctive R2-D2, like chatter. And the males, especially in the earlier mornings, will fly up and just like just fly around like a wind-up doll singing it. Um, so because they are so plain colored, they rely very heavily on their vocalizations to attract each other. Um, so they're there, you'll, you'll hear them. There's no, no doubt in my mind. And they're nice because they are really distinctive songs. They're not like a little, you know, trill or quiet or anything. Like they're, they're you'll, you'll hear them and recognize them if you just give them a listen beforehand. Great, thanks, Kevin. Um, and it's it's eight o'clock, so I think we'll stop there. Um, but again, we'll be sharing um a follow up email with the recording, um Kevin's email, and some follow up resources as well. Um, we also um when you exit the webinar, you'll see a brief survey. Um, we'd love to hear your feedback on this event if you have anything to share with us. Um, and you know, thank you again for coming. Thank you so much, Kevin, for this really terrific presentation. And we hope to see you at future um Center for Eco Studies and Land Trust events. So have a great night, everyone. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, everyone. It was nice being here.